We want to welcome you out this morning to a very special Anzac Day commemoration service that we're having here. Uh, Perth at the moment is in lockdown for three days and so uh, we've had to come back online to present our church services and so uh, we really do appreciate you being with us again here this morning. We're going to just go before the Lord uh, and believe God for miracles and God's uh, uh, blessing the work here and helping men and women at the Williton Potter's house. We want to be praying for a number of needs. If we can remember to pray for Elijah, we want to be praying for Lisa, uh, for Emma and Cameron this morning. We want to be praying for our new believers, but also we want to be praying for our international conference that's happening uh, at the end of this week. We want to be believing God for just favor that COVID would be compliant during this time and that we would see the favor of God all next week during our conference and so uh, we're going to go before the Lord in needs of prayer if you have a, a need this morning and if you would bring that speak it out don't just keep it in your mind but speak it out there's something powerful about speaking it with your words and we're going to believe God for miracles for your life and for the work here in Williton so let's pray as we do uh, brother Stein is going to come to uh, the pulpit and he's going to open us in prayer father we pray this morning God, that during this special day of commemoration, God, that you would be with our own families, that you would be with this work here in Williton, God. We're praying for your special anointing. We pray for our new believers, for Elijah, for Lisa, for Emma and Cameron this morning, God. And I pray that your work of heaven and grace uh, would fall upon this place. God, minister during our conference. Yes, God, we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that despite, oh Lord God, the lockdown, we're not locked out, oh Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for the souls, oh Lord God, that we have been contending. We pray for our new believers, God, believing that we will see them grow here in this church. We ask, Lord, for our conference that you, oh Lord God, will be sovereign, that you, oh Lord Jesus, will bring the delegates here safe and sound. We ask, oh Lord, for your divine protection to be upon our gathering our church and our fellowship, believing, O oh Lord God, that you are for us in these very last days. And all the saints shout, Amen. We're going to just uh, quickly make some announcements this morning. If you can remember, remember uh, if you can remember that we are in lockdown. So uh, as soon as that comes down, which we're believing will be on Monday, midnight, Monday night, we'll be in service back here in this building on Wednesday evening. Please all come out as we gather together. It'd be a kind of nice place of celebration after the last three days. And so Wednesday night, the doors are open at 6.30 p.m. for prayer and then our service at 7.30 p.m. We're going to have a great time. And then we're going to roll right into our conference beginning the next weekend. We have Pastor Tony Huang from the church in Fairfield, Sydney, preaching on the Sunday morning. And then in the evening, we will be having uh, ministering for us. Pastor George Uma uh, will be coming and ministering on Sunday evening. He originally, him and his wife, are out of this work here in Williton. And we will have a great time having them here, celebrating with them as they come back, bringing a victory report on Sunday night. We're going to change right now, receive the offering of the morning, believe God. And uh, up behind me on the screen up there is going to be all the details to give electronically. And we pray that you do do that. And uh, we really desperately need you to be people that would honor God's word and you would honor God with your finances. As many of you know, Anzac Day has fallen on Sunday this year. Uh, it's very uh, interesting to me that uh, is a time that the church can actually honor uh, this commemoration, this, this sacrifice that so many people made uh, uh, many years ago, all through the uh, conflicts that Australia has been involved in, that men and women volunteered, many of them, to give their lives to a greater cause. There's a scripture in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 9, 7 that says, Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. If you do a little bit of history or a bit of study about Anzac Day, many of the men that responded in 1915, they did it more so because of a financial gain in their lives uh, Australia at the time was very depressed in the economy. There was not much work around. And many of them found out they could make six shillings a day. 
Uh, in our slang language, we call it Six Bob, and they were affectionately uh, nicknamed the Six Bob Tourists because they volunteered to go and, uh, and give their lives in the, fir- I- I- in the beaches of Gallipoli, and, uh, but they were given that affectionate term. Uh, but what's interesting is that most of them volunteered. They volunteered and knew that they were also going to receive a very basic wage. Uh, six shillings a day wasn't very much. And I was thinking about that, that these men did it knowing that people were behind them. The Australian government, those people were going to help them. They're going to equip them. They're going to give them uniforms. They're going to give them the weapons they would need to be able to uh, fight the fight. And you must remember that these young men saw the fight as good over evil. They didn't see it as anything that, you know, is, is not some kind of insurgent war. They saw it as fighting evil. And they embraced it with a a righteous attitude to be able to go into that conflict. We here this morning are also involved in a war. And we also believe this morning that our fight is a fight of good over evil. And if we are to do that properly, we're going to need people to understand that if we're going to fight, it's going to cost not just equipment and men, it's going to cost money. And I ask this morning that if you recognize the spiritual warfare that we've been in and that we are in, that you would give to the cause or you would give to the battle. And with your tithes, your offerings, no matter who you are, what you are, we we really are all in this together. And I encourage you this morning to give in the offering, respond in liberality and generosity. And uh, let's, uh, let's do that this morning. We're going to pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being in this building. I thank you, Lord God, that where our lives are lived in fighting of the conflict, Father, I pray that we we wage war not against flesh and blood, but in spiritual realms and spiritual terms, uh, we are involved in a conflict. Father, I pray that through that spiritual conflict, God, we would recognize the power of money to be released to help us to fight evil with the goodness of God. I pray this morning you would release liberality and generosity through these precious people. Help us as a church, God, uh, to wage war against the enemy. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. It's a great privilege this morning. We have a guest speaker. And uh, Pastor Bruce Callahan uh, originally grew up on the east coast of America, but as a young man saw opportunity to come to Australia as a, a, as a teacher. They were advertising in the newspapers in the United States for uh, people to come to Australia. And I'm sure he didn't really know what he was getting into when he came and took a position in a little country town called Geraldton. And uh, he, no doubt, not more than just coming to experience Australia, he experienced a radical transformation of Jesus Christ coming into his life. And uh, he's going to come and minister this morning on his perspective as someone maybe from another nation seeing how Australia responds. Uh, and the whole, uh, the whole thing of Anzac Day is a mystery to many people outside of our nation. And I'm going to welcome him to come and preach this morning. Let's do that. Let's give him, let's give him a round of welcome, welcome this morning. God, I count it a real privilege to be here and an honor because basically I'm a very profane man. And I say that because the word profanity is not just swear words. It's a person who takes something that is sacred and treats it as common. And for me, I I grew up on the East Coast, a very radical, rebellious little fellow, and ultimately came to Australia. And what I found was a bunch of little radical, rebellious little fellows. And when I came to Jesus, I found a reason for my rebellion, that I could rebel against the evil that I was pro- propagating, and I could really begin to live uh, for Jesus Christ. And there's some things that I'm going to be speaking about this morning that I'm sure Australians don't even know, and uh, I certainly didn't know. I became an Australian citizen in 1994, And that made me a dual citizen with two passports. And ever since I was 19 years old, I really did want to come uh, to Australia. 
And I don't know what it was. Something was drawing me here. I believe that was God now. I didn't know it then. I didn't know who God was. I knew about him, but I didn't know him. I wound up marrying a wonderful Australian woman that has kept me saved as long as uh, she's been with me, and she's been a great blessing to my life. And every time when we were in America, or even when, when we were in Australia here, we went back to America. I was here for 20 years, went back to America, just to have returned back here. We would uh, celebrate the Australian holidays. They have lots of Australian shops in America, and so when we would cut, Australia Day was in January, and in January we would always celebrate that. There would be all Australian flags in our house. Uh, we would sing, we still, still call Australia home. Uh, we would have uh, meat pies and sausage rolls and pavlova and uh, Anzac cookies and uh, all of the, the Australiana that was there. But I never really understood much about Anzac Day. My wife always did. In fact, she's very disappointed that she can't go. Tomorrow she was intending to go to Monument Hill in Fremantle to the 5 o'clock or 5.30 service there and, and watch that take place there. But she is not able to do that, and so she was disappointed. Because it would be the first time she had done it in 25 years. But when we were in places, we always did celebrate those days. You know, Australia was discovered by James Cook in 1780. And in 1788, 11 ships with petty criminals claimed Australia as a colony for England. And that's because they lost all the criminals that came to America, <laughs> as America had a revolutionary war. And sadly, though, people are really ignorant of the Christian origins of Australia. They think it's a criminal origin, but I'm here to tell you, it's not a criminal or origin at all. The flag of Australia is incredibly Christian. That flag of Australia has four different crosses on it, and three of those crosses are crosses of Christian men that lived in the first 400 years of, uh, of Christianity. Very strong Christians. And, you know, they're, they're trying to rewrite history. You cannot rewrite history because history is his story. And Australia is a people of the cross. America is a people of the cross. And I want to talk to you about the people of the cross, and I want to talk to you about the power of the cross, and I want to talk to you also about the purpose of the cross. Because these young Australians that went there, they went there, uh, and they went there, and, and when you look at it, uh, the flag echoes the grand design upon this land, and the demonic designs that are to change all of that. Because the cross offends people. And when you look uh, at all of that thing, I want to talk to you about another citizenship. Yes, I'm an Australian citizen. Yes, an American citizen. But before I'm an American, before I'm an Australian, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a person of the cross. I know the power of the cross, and I know the purpose uh, of that cross. That's what these men. Australia was only a teenager. When, Ameri when, when, when the Anzac Day happened on April the 25th in 1915, Australia had only been a nation for 14 years. It was a 14-year-old teenager. And many of the young men that went there were young teenagers that lied about their age because they wanted to get in the battle. They wanted to get in the fight. They wanted to distinguish themselves that day. Because that day, on April the 25th, 1915, this 14-year-old nation became a nation in a great, great way. It defined the character of this new nation. And for the vast majority of the 16,000 Australians that went there, and New Zealanders, they landed that first day on the Gallipoli Beach, which became known as Anzac Cove. They landed that day. And for them, most of them, it was their first experience in war. 2,000 of them would not live the next 24 hours. Many of them died before they even got onto the beach. They dug trenches and they became known as diggers. They were known as diggers before that. That's another story. But by evening, 2,000 of them had been killed or wounded. And I want to take some time and I want to treat this as very sacred. Because I, I, that's how I see Australians see this day probably one of the most sacred and most reverent days in all of Australia. And I want to bring it to the understanding of how sacred you are, how much you mean to Jesus, that you're a person of the cross, that you should know the power of the cross, 
that you would know the purpose of the cross. These young men on that day did exactly what Jesus did. He said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life. And these men did that day. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open to the book of Galatians in chapter uh, 6. And I want to read there uh, a few portions of Scripture there. In uh, Galatians chapter 6, I want you just to catch the picture of this and, and get... This is Paul writing, and he's really upset because people have not valued something very important. In Galatians 6, 11, he goes, See with large, large letters I have written to you with my own hand. There's a big exclamation point there. It's like he's saying, You see with what large letters I've written to you with my own hand. Paul didn't do much writing, but he wrote this one. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, verse 12, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of the Christ. For even those who are circumcised, they keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they would boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in anything except the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision that avails anything. But by the cross of Christ, you become a new creation. Let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. Father, I thank you that you brought me to this nation. God, that you'd made me a citizen of this nation. But Father, I'm ever thankful that I'm a people of the cross, that you'd made me a citizen of heaven. Father, I pray you'd help me to speak about the power of your cross. Father, you'd help me to speak about the purpose of your cross, and you'd help me to bring that all together, God, in this Anzac Day service, uh, in Jesus' name. So I want you to think, first of all, with me, about the cross of Jesus Christ. It goes way beyond our flesh. It went way beyond the flesh of those young diggers that day as they went in, man. They went in, they went up over the trenches uh, and they went uh, and they gave their lives for something that they believed in. And that's what happened uh, that day. The world wants all the boasting of the cross to stop. They want to make other symbols. They want to give you the peace symbol. They want to give you the fish symbol. They want to give you the dove symbol. But Paul's writing to religious people, Judaizers of that time, that, uh, that were deceiving the Galatian people. They wanted them to circumcise Christians, which was a part of a Jewish ritual, rather than have this relationship with Jesus Christ. These men from Australia had a relationship with their country, 14 years old, and they decided, you know what, we're men and we can do this, regardless of what was going to happen. A religion and ritual is all a poor relationship, a poor substitute for relationship. That's man-made, that's manipulative. And Paul was ticked off at this. That's why he said, I wrote this in large letters. How dare they? And all false religions have a human component to it. There's something that you can do that's going to make you right with this God. But really, there's nothing that you can do except receive what he's done and what he wants to do. And he'll put that in your heart, and you'll be a people of that cross. He wrote in Galatians 6.11, See with what large letters that I've written to you, in my own hand. An exclamation point. Every attempt will be omitted to rid the earth of the offense of the cross, because of the significance of the cross. Because when you lay down your life for something other than your life, you enter into the people of the cross. You enter into that. Philippians in chapter 3, verse 18. For many walk whom I've often told you, and I tell you now, even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, and they set their mind on earthly things. Listen, if you don't, haven't realized it already, when you set your mind on earthly things, you make yourself an enemy of the cross and you really mess up your head because the earthly things are always changing. Peter would there, and Peter would have a great revelation, and in a moment of time he lost it like that, and Jesus said to him, Get behind me, Satan, in Matthew 16, 23. He turned to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but you are mindful of the things of men. 
Let me tell you, when you're mindful of the things of men more than you're mindful of the things of God, you become an enemy of the cross. Because the cross is all about sacrifice. And we're great for sacrifice as long as people are sacrificing for me. But those teenagers, those young men, those young Australians and New Zealanders that went up over that thing, they were sacrificing their life for this country. And we're here today because they were there yesterday. People were accusing Paul of preaching one thing and doing another thing. But Paul says, you know, there's nothing but the cross. There's nothing but this sacrifice that I see that makes the difference. He said in Galatians 5.11, And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. And the Message Bible says in verse 12, why do these agitators, obsessive as they are about circumcision, they go all the way and just castrate themselves? It's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Listen to these words. He's called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use your freedom for whatever you want to do, which destroys your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love because that's how freedom grows. That's what happened on that day, April 25th. Men gave their lives so that you and I could have the freedom we have today. Verse 14 goes on to say, For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, Love others as you love yourself. That is the true act of freedom. If you bite and if you ravage, if you do all of those things, if you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time, you'll be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this. Listen to this counsel. Live freely, animated, motivated by being a people of the cross, God's spirit, and you won't feed the compulsions of your selfish flesh. The devil's strategy has always been, and will always be, bondage disguised as freedom. Real freedom is only found at the cross. Real freedom is only found when you go up out of the trench and you don't care what's going on in front of you, man. You've got a purpose in life because you're a person of the cross. You know the power of the cross and you know the purpose of the cross. Crosses have you know, an incredible rich heritage in this criminal colony called Australia. This flag here has four different crosses on it. And it just didn't come about. It wasn't a random thing. God's hand, God's fingerprints are all over Australia. God's fingerprints are all over uh, you and I. There are four crosses on that flag that go far beyond the flesh, uh, far beyond British heritage, far beyond that. It's a Christian heritage of that cross, that, that flag. The crosses that are there are Christian men, four, three Christian men. St. George, St. Andrew, and St. Patrick. These were all early Christians. These were real men, real Christians that lived in the first 400 years after Jesus died and rose again. And they were people of the cross. The fourth cross is even more interesting. The fourth cross is the Southern Cross. And the Southern Cross is the smallest of all the constellations, 88 constellations. The Southern Cross is the smallest. It's also the brightest. It's also only seen in the Southern Hemisphere since the Christian era. You used to be able to see it in the Northern Hemisphere, but you can't. I just found that pretty interesting. God has some designs down under. <laughs> he has some designs down under here. The hand of God moving history behind the scenes. The enemies of the cross are always trying to erase its significance and erase its meaning and erase its power. The original Union Jack had nothing to do with England. The original Union Jack was actually the cross of St. George. And I'm going to talk about him in a moment. It was simply a red cross on a white background. That was the original Union Jack and the cross of England. Because everything we're learning about ourselves is being rewritten and being regurgitated in not a first way. In America, they just... You know, all the riots, they're breaking down all the things. Columbus, they hated Christopher Columbus. Uh, but I want you to know, when America was founded, uh, Christopher Columbus came because he thought he was on a mission from God. Nobody, I, nobody ever told me that. I watched them just try to tear down our history and rewrite our history. But let me just read something to you about that formation. All I've ever read or been taught about Columbus uh, said he discovered the new world by accident uh, 
and his trade route to the East Indies. You don't go to the East Indies when you go west to find America. It was a flat earth at that time. He had a horrible time getting, a, uh, no mention is ever made of his faith in Jesus, let alone he felt be given this a life mission directly by God. And the words of Christopher Columbus himself, I found them in a journal. Let me read them to you about why he came to America. They found in the obscure volume of journal, it says he had a great degree of difficulty. He writes, and he says these, these words, what he's written. It was the Lord who put it into my hand, mind. I could feel his hand upon me. The fact that I would be able to possible to sail here to the East Indies. All who heard my project rejected with laughter, ridiculing me, saying it was a flat earth. There was no question the inspiration for this came from the Holy Spirit because he comforted me with rays of marvelous inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. This is Christopher Columbus. This is what's tearing down. He says, I am a most unworthy sinner, but I've cried out to the Lord for grace and mercy, and they've covered me completely. I've found the sweetest consolation since I made it my whole purpose to enjoy his marvelous presence. The execution of the journey to the Indies has been wonderful. I did not use and I did not make use of intelligence, mathematics, or maps. It is simply the fulfillment of what Isaiah the prophesied. No one, listen to these words, no one should fear to undertake any task in the name of our Savior. If it is just and if it is intention is purely for his holy service, the working out of all those things, he's assigned to every person as it happens according to his sovereign will. And he found uh, the United States of America. He landed there. And people would ultimately come later on and settle there. And when you look at that, you know, the first people that came to America, they came for God. But the second people that came to America, they came for gold in the form of fur pelts and tobacco. The first ones came to Massachusetts. The second ones came uh, unto Jamestown. And it's been God and gold, God and gold. But it's all been sacrifice. It's all been a people of the cross. So let's look at these three crosses of these men. Let's look who these men are. These three crosses and their significance to Australia and to you and to me and the power of those early diggers on that dawn morning going over to the other side. The cross of St. George, if you look at that, that's a white background with a red cross. It wasn't British cross. George was actually born in 3rd century in Cappadocia, Turkey, to very noble Christian parents. And he became a, a professional soldier in the Roman army, and a known for a, his, his reputation was one of a fierce fighter, and one that was a very uh, a high rank. He had a great reputation for courage and bravery. And then the Roman emperor of the day, whose name was Diocletian, he outlawed Christianity. And when he outlawed Christianity, George resigned his position. And then because he had such influence, uh, they, 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 like I said, they already had this flag, they had such influence uh, that he went uh, and tried to persuade Diocletian to let Christianity come back. You know what happened for that? They crucified him, 3, 303 A.D. As I said, he was known for his bravery, his courage, his commitment, uh, his non-compromise. That's the Red Cross. That's also the cross of these diggers that went in there, man. No compromise. They were going over the edge. They were going after the enemy. Many of them had never been in war. Some of them incredibly ill-equipped. Some of them had no, no shoes, uh, but they went uh, because they believed uh, in the coming of age uh, that men were going to fight for something that was worthwhile fighting. And let me tell you, Australia is worthwhile fighting for. That original Union Jack is actually a symbol of mercy. It's the International Red Cross. There's a legend of St. George. You have a St. George's Building Society, or you used to have one here in Australia. And the legend was that George saw scorched fields with trampled people and a beautiful maiden hiding in the city. And the dragon was at the city at the bay and holding the city at bay. The dragon was demanding the sacrifice of two sheep every day. And then when they ran out of sheep, he said, I want the damsel. George says, you know what? You ain't having the damsel. So legend has it that he rides out on his horse. The dragon tries to swallow him. He takes the sword, kills the dragon. And that's all legend, of course. But you know what isn't legend is the dragon that's trying to take out Australia. The dragon that's trying to take out you and I. The Bible talks about him in Revelations 12, verse 9. 
that great dragon, that ancient serpent, uh, that one called the devil and Satan who led the whole world astray and thrown out. Uh, and all his angels uh, with him, they were thrown down to earth and they've been wreaking havoc here for a long time. But because we're a people of a cross, we have the power of the cross. and We can take him out. And Australians are very brave and uncompromising and courageous, uh, but a lot of those virtues, they're trying to be erased today. These Australian young men, they rushed into that war. They rushed into that war excited to prove the strength and the character of their nation, this new nation, and to take their place on the world stage. They knew who they were. They knew what they had been forged into their character on that Anzac Day in Gallipoli. They became a symbol of the Australian national identity. That's when Australian identity was crystallized at that point. That Anzac Day landing on Gallipoli, they had a sense of Australian nationhood was born. Saying we're part of something even greater than Australia, but we need to take our place in that and take their place they did. The new nation was defined. It became known as the Anzac legend, and it encompassed their bravery, their ingenuity, their endurance, and a comradeship that became known as mateship. They were not going to let one another die alone. They'd run across those things. That, like I said, the first ones didn't even get to the beach. The next ones got to the beach, uh, but they were in, started digging trenches. So, because you're looking at a, 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 an enemy, the Turkish enemy had machine guns uh, up on a ridge. They were just like sitting ducks. Uh, they got in these trenches, uh, and then when their time came, they looked at one and over, and over they went. And most of them didn't get 10, 15, 20 feet, and they were mowed down and died right there. But greater love has this than no man who lays down his life for sure. I wonder how many of those young Australians are going to be in heaven. Because I think that's what the way God judges things. He doesn't judge by the flesh. He judges by the spirit. And the spirit of those young men went up and over regardless of the cost. The cross of St. Andrew is a white cross on a blue brick background. It has deep significance. Andrew was a fisherman from Galilee. He was Peter's brother. He was known for his ability to bring people to Jesus Christ. And throughout the Bible, beginning with his brother, we see him doing that. We see him doing the natural and we see God doing the supernatural. Because if you want to see God do the supernatural, we've got to do the natural. We've got to be those people of the cross. We've got to be those people uh, that know the power of the cross. And throughout that, you see him. He became a missionary. He was ultimately crucified diagonally because he would not see, he would not let himself be crucified the same way as Jesus. And he was crucified diagonally because he was not worthy of the cross of Jesus. He was crucified in uh, Petrus, Greece. He became a patron saint uh, of the Scotland and fishermen. And this became, this is the national flag of Scotland, a white cross on blue background because of the boats. The third cross that you look at there is the cross of St. Patrick. It's a diagonal uh, red cross on a white background. Who was St. Patrick? Uh, St. Patrick became the patron saint of Ireland, but he was not from Ireland. He was born on uh, uh, March 17th in 385 AD. He was born uh, uh, in Scotland to very wealthy parents. Uh, then he was captured at 16 years old by the Irish. Uh, he was brought to in captivity and enslaved in Ireland. Uh, he escaped back to England uh, and after six years of captivity in England, uh, he escaped uh, back again uh, and he, he would convert, he, he had a dream from God that he would convert Ireland. And it took him some time but he returned to Ireland in 432 AD at 47 years old and said, I'm going to win Ireland to Jesus. He died there in 469 A.D. I'm Irish and Italian, and I'm from a very Irish section of Boston, and St. Patrick's Day is about nothing but green beer <laughs> in Boston. That's profane. Okay. That's profane. St. Patrick's Day, the Celtics, or green, you know, it, it, you know. But these were the crosses that Australia chose to associate in the formation of their nation. In 1901, it became a federation. Just 14 years before Anzac Day, it became a federation. And 
These are the flags that they chose. They chose a blue background. They chose that blue background because of the, uh, the, the oceans, and then they chose that, I said, the Southern Cross. The first settlers to arrive in Australia were pioneers. They were explorers. They were adventurers. They arrived by sea. They were British. They were Scottish. They were Irish. And God called the people to that nation from all over the world. He's still calling people to that nation from all over the world. He's still calling people from all over the world. To where? To the most isolated city in the world. And then he decided, you know what, I'm going to reach the world <laughs> from this most isolated city. And the smallest city in all of Australia. And that's what he's doing. He's bringing people to that. He called us here for his purposes. He's given us his power because we will be people of the cross. People that will go out of the trenches. People that will go in the face of all adversity. We're going to have a conference here in another week or so. And there's going to be people that will go and people that will send. And we need both. They have to both have the same kind of courage. They may be doing different things. But I'm here to tell you, that's why we're here. We're the people of the cross. We've got the power of the cross and we've got the purpose of the cross. That is to reach others. The world's drifting away from that, the enemies of the cross. Let me ask you this this morning on this Anzac Day morning. What's the enemy of your cross? Who's the enemy of your cross? What is the sacrifices that Jesus calls you to recognize and be involved in? Because we all have crosses. Every one of us. You know, our jobs are cross. <laughs> our children are cross. Our marriages are crosses. How do we handle those? How do we do it? Let me finish with the one final thing, and that's the purpose of the cross. Lest we forget. Boasting in the cross and its power and its purpose, its people. Never let it be erased. Never let it be wiped out of your mind. God brought you to this wonderful nation for you and I that we might know him. And then in knowing him, making him known to others. Never let it be wiped out or its significance or its symbol because it's the same. It's his story. It's his story. You know, let me just read to you what a crucifixion is like from a medical point of view. This is a doctor's description of the crucifixion of the cross. The cross is placed in the ground and the exhausted man is quickly thrown backward and his shoulders against the wood. The Roman soldiers are feeling for the depression in the front of his wrist. He drives a heavy square wrought iron through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly moves to the other side, feels it again and does the same thing. Being careful not to pull the arms too tightly but to allow some flex and some movement. The left foot is placed on top of the right foot with both feet extending and the toys, toes going down. A nail is driven through the arch of each of those, leaving the knees flexed. And then the cross is lifted up and it's dropped into its place and the weight of that man sinks down and it pulls and fiery pain shoots up from his legs, from his feet, from his arms, from his legs and they burn in his brain, they explode in the brain. The nails in the wrist are putting pressure on the medium nerves. As he pushes himself out to avoid stretching downward, he places the full weight of nails on his feet. Again, he feels the searing agony of the nails tearing through the nerves between the bones in his feet. His arms are fatiguing. His cramps are sweeping through his muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps come the inability to push himself up to breathe. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but it's not exhaled. exhaled. He fights to raise himself up by pushing off on his feet. And again, all the pain cuts through, partially subsiding spasmodically as he he pushes himself up and tries to breathe in and breathe out. Hours of limitless pain, cycling, joint-rending cramps, intermediate partial asphyxiation and choking. Searing as the pain is torn, his lacerated back, he moves up and down against that rough timber, scraping at it. Then in agony, he begins deep crushing pain in the chest as the pericardium begins to fill up with blood and begins to compress the heart. It's almost loss of tissue in the flu and almost over because the loss of tissue fluid it's reaching a critical level and it's compressing the heart it's struggling to pump the heavy thick sluggish 
blood into the tissues and the tortured lungs of making frantic effort to and a gap to escape the gulp of air. He feels the chill of the death creeping towards his tissue. All this is recorded in the Bible as then they crucified him. That's what the crucifixion, that's pretty, pretty powerful, man. And he shouted something. He shouted, it is finished. And everything that he could do for us, he did that day. Now it's up to us to know the purpose of the cross, why he finished that. Man that's lost in lust for himself and God's love and pursuit, uh, sin's power was broken. Uh, everyone's going to come to the cross. Everyone's going to acknowledge that. Uh, everyone's going to see that. Uh, and others accepting or rejecting and rearranging. And in Colossians, in chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, and by him, and him is Jesus. It's got a capital H uh, in my Bible. By him uh, to reconcile all things uh, to himself. Uh, by him, whether on earth or things in heaven, uh, having made peace uh, through the blood of his cross and you being dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh Jesus has made alive together having been forgiven by his trespasses Colossians 2 verse 13 and you being dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh he's made alive together with him having been forgiven having riped out a the handwriting requirements that was against us and was contrary to us. He wiped out sin and its power, sin and its effects, sin and all of its effects in our life, its sickness and disease and poverty. Listen, COVID-19 has got us shut down. Uh, Stein wonderfully put it, we're maybe locked out, but we're not, we're maybe locked down, but we're not locked out. Uh, these men uh, that went into that war, they didn't have uh, all they needed to have, uh, but they had one thing in their heart. Uh, as young men, they were going to prove themselves as men, and over the trenches they went, uh, mowed down, uh, carrying one another back into those trenches. This is not a fairy tale. This is much more than a flag. It's the hand of God in the heart of men. It's the people of the cross and the power of the cross and the purpose of the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions. And all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. But don't fall short on this Anzac Day. Remember these young men. Remember them, many of them. Just think about them. I never want you to see the Australian flag again and, and look at it again without remembering what you've heard today. That you'll remember that God formed this nation for a purpose, has a great destiny. Because you know what? We bear the cross, we don't wear the cross. We bear the cross. We sacrifice for our families. We sacrifice for our wives, our sons, our daughters. We sacrifice for our workmates. Uh, sacrifice uh, is really what happens because when you sacrifice, Jesus' uh, sacrifice rose from there. These men sacrificed. John chapter 19, verse 17. And Jesus bearing his cross he went out to a place called the place of the skull, which he in Hebrew is called Golgotha. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. You know the Jews? The Jews were wanderers. They were wanderers. That's what the word means, they were wanderers. You know what? Austra Australians wander. Americans wander. I wandered here. But when I wandered here, I found wonder. The wonder of the cross. The wonder of a like-minded people. I, lo I, I love the Australian people because they so much remind me of people where I come from. In the Boston area, we were rebels. We were just rebelling against the wrong things. The Australians have a nice rebellious little attitude, and I love them. Let's, let's use that to rebel against hell. All of you that have come from other nations, you've got your own citizenship. But I tell you, God brought you here, and he brought you here for a purpose that you would rebel against hell. That you would become part of the purposes of the cross. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. And being found in the appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of the death, even the death of the cross. These young men... They humbled themselves and they went up out of their trenches and they died so you and I could live. You know, they have a, a term called PTSD for wartime now. It's post-traumatic stress syndrome. 
Can I tell you, I know a lot of people that have PTSD. It's called post-traumatic spiritual disorder. But you don't have to have that. You can go on and be on. Let me leave you with this scripture. And think about Anzac Day. Think about this flag and the men, the Christian men, George, Patrick, Andrew. But think about the Christian man, Jesus. It says, therefore, verse 1, chapter 12 of Hebrews, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin that so easily besets us and run the race with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy, who for the joy, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Yet you've not resisted, resisted unto bloodshed, striving against sin. You know, if you miss the cross, you miss it all. If you miss the cross, the crosses that come to your life, you miss it all. Because every cross is an opportunity for you to sacrifice your flesh, to see that spirit rise in your life and move powerfully. There are no small crosses. They're always a big deal. Some of them are hidden. What are your hidden crosses? What are your small crosses? In your life, when was the last time you did something for someone else besides yourself? Not just to feel good about yourself, but just for someone else. When was the last time that you did something for someone else and you did feel good about yourself? These men went across and they died. They gave their lives for what they believed in. Let me just tell you how the 12 disciples died. History recorded it for us. Matthew suffered martyrdom after being slain with a sword in a distant city of Ethiopia. Mark died in Alexandria in Egypt after being cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. Luke was hung up on an olive tree in Greece. John was put in a pot of boiling oil, but he escaped that death in a miraculous manner. Afterwards, he was banished to Patmos. Peter was crucified in Rome upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified the same way as Jesus. James, the Lord's brother, was beheaded at Jerusalem. The other James, uh, the disciple, was thrown off a lofty pinnacle in the temple, uh, and he was beaten to death with a club uh, just to make sure he was dead. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Uh, Andrew was bound to the cross uh, in the shape of an X, as I already said, but he preached to his persecutors until he expired. Bar Thomas was run through with a blunt lance in East Indies. Jude was shot with an arrow. Matthias was stoned and then he beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death. Paul, after various tortures, was beheaded. I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. And my crosses are pretty small compared to those. Mine are very small compared to those. Embrace the power of the cross. Don't be embarrassed by the power of the cross. Embrace the purpose of the cross. I was talking with Pastor Graham about this sermon. He uh, told me a very interesting Irwin it told me a very interesting quote that Erwin Rommel, General Erwin Rommel, made. It was about the fighting uh, uh, ability of the Australians and the New Zealands. He was one of the great military generals uh, in history. He studied uh, throughout all military colleges. His strategic. Uh, but he came up against something, he came up against something strong and powerful against uh, the Australians and the New Zealanders. He was the leader of the German army, and after fighting against the Australians and the New Zealanders, he said these words. Listen very carefully to this. He said, if I had to take hell, I would use the Australians to take it, and then I would use the New Zealanders uh, to hold it. That's pretty powerful. If I had to take hell... 
I would use the Australians to take it and the New Zealanders to hold it. In that campaign of Anzac, 8,700 Australians and New Zealanders gave their life. Do you know how many Turkish people would get that taken out? The Turkish soldiers was 87,000, 10 to 1. The Australians and New Zealanders were outgunned, they were outmanned, and yet they took their enemy out. That's what we're called. We're called to take hell out. You can take hell out of your life today by just letting Jesus in. And I wonder how many of those Anzac boys are going to be in heaven. Because in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 13, no greater love has no one than this, and they lay down their lives for their friends. You know, when Jesus laid down his life for me, I was an enemy. But I'm a friend, and he's my friend. We want to thank you for being with us on this Anzac Day as we honor these young men who died so valiantly, many of them teenagers, the nation of Australia, just a teenager, 14 years old, as they went in, up and over those trenches, they took out 10 times as many people as they got. Would you bow your heads with me right there, wherever you are? Just think for a moment about the power of the cross. Become a person of the cross. Embrace the crosses that come in your life. The moments where you need to sacrifice that you don't want to because they're the greatest thing that will ever happen to you. When you understand the purpose of Christ, the purpose of the cross and the purpose of Christ is to rise again different. Rise again different. You're here, you've never been born again. You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. The unfortunate thing of life is you've probably given your life to a lot of other things, but they've never given you life. And you want to come to Jesus right now, right there where you are. He gave his life for you to give his life to you. The reason he wants to give his life to you Simply, we don't do a real good job of it on our own. If you pray these words, it's not so much the words that you pray. It's the attitude of your heart. Because really, you are called to be a people of the cross. A person of the cross. Allowing Jesus' sacrifice to help you in every sacrifice you'll ever have and you'll know the power of that cross and you'll understand the purpose is that you'll change pray this simple prayer with me right now say father in the name of Jesus I come to you as I am with no hope except the precious blood of Jesus Christ Jesus I believe that you died for me on the cross at Calvary, that they buried you, and that you rose again on the third day. Right now, I want you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to forgive others who have sinned against me. Help me to forgive myself for my own sin against me. And right now, I receive your love, your acceptance, and your forgiveness. And I'll live my life not by my might, not by my power, but by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. How do you feel? My life was radically changed when I prayed a prayer very similar to that. If you prayed that prayer, there will be some details that are going to be up on the screen. Links that you can know we want to know you, we want to help you, we want to see you. If you're a backslider and you prayed that prayer, 
We really do want to help you. We love you and we care about you because we're people of the cross here at the Potter's House Williton. We're a people that understand the power of the cross is to set people free. Same way as those Anzac boys went across the bridges and trenches. We understand the purpose of the cross is that we can all be better than we ever thought we could be by the blood of Jesus. We have services here and we will have services here. It's Wednesday night as this COVID thing shuts it down. We'll be starting a conference uh, in Beachboro the following week on a Monday night. But more than anything, on this Anzac Day, remember what dying's all about. Because we're all dying. No one's getting out of here alive. <laughs> we're all going to die. And remember these that willingly gave their lives to establish a nation and the character of a nation. Bold, unashamed, no nonsense. This is who we are, this is what we do. You know, when you saw Australia come on the national stage, you see it on the national stage everywhere. Small, isolated, yet excellence in every arena of life when you look at it. Excellence in every arena of life, whether that's the technical world, whether that's the sporting world. But all that excellence has a source, and that source is the people of the cross. That source is the power of the cross. That source is the purpose of the cross. We really do want to thank you for tuning in. We hope that you have a wonderful Anzac Day. Enjoy each other. Enjoy this beautiful country that God's given to us. Thank you. We do not know this Australian's name, and we never will. We do not know his rank or his battalion. He may have been one of those who believed the Great War would be an adventure too grand to miss. He may have felt that he would never live down the shame of not going. The unknown soldier honours the memory of all those men and women who laid down their lives for Australia. We've lost more than 100,000 lives, but we've gained a legend and a deeper understanding of what it means to be Australian. He's a drover drifting over western plains He's a city lad, a clock down Flinders Lane They're in the trenches at Lone Pine And on the Flanders firing line A wheeling band of ordinary men He's all a man, he's one of us Born beneath the Southern Cross Seaman on the Armadale mm, She's a nurse in Vietnam They're on patrol in Oriskam Sons and daughters rides into the car She's all a man She's one of us Born beneath the Southern Cross Side by 
spirit of the Anzacs will live on and